Hi everyone, it's me, Lauren Brasalio, and I am the founder here at Libro. I'm so excited to be talking to you guys. As you may or may not know right now, it's National Eating Disorder Awareness Week. That's in America, I'm up in Canada, but we still take part in the events. And today I'm going to be talking to you about some healthy coping mechanisms or coping skills that really helped me through my recovery from an eating disorder. So without wasting any time, let's just get right into it. I have five coping skills that I wanted to share with you guys. And then I have a couple that didn't really work with me early on in recovery for reasons that I'll explain, but now really helped me a lot. So I'm gonna to touch on those as well. These aren't in any specific order. Um, they just, I wrote them down as they kind of seem to flow into one another, um, but it's not a priority list by any means. So the first one is through positive um, thinking and thought patterns. And that kind of sounds strange, but I will explain. I learned about this from this book. This is the Dialectical Behavior Therapy Skills Workbook for Bulimia specifically. This is a series of books. They cover anorexia, bulimia. Um, there's a bunch of them. I found this one at Chapters. This one is by Ellen Astrichin Fletcher and Michael Maslar. I've talked about this a lot. I'm gonna post all the information also in the description below. So in this book, I learned about a DBT skill where you kind of take charge of your thinking and walk yourself through it using reason. So how I'll explain this is, you know, when I was struggling with bulimia, I struggled a lot with emotional eating and emotional binging. And as we all know, um, eating doesn't actually help you cope with your feelings, at least, you know, and it doesn't actually fix any problems. But when you're in those moments where your thoughts are just overtaking you and it's all negative thoughts, unhealthy thoughts, it's really hard to get out of that. So in that workbook, they walk you through some stages. So let's say, you know, I feel the urge to, to binge, to eat emotionally. Um, the first thing that I do instead of going to the kitchen is sit down with myself and sit down with my feelings and ask myself some questions. So the first question is, how am I feeling right now? So let's say, you know, I'm feeling lonely. Loneliness has always been a big trigger for me. So I'm feeling lonely. Will feeling, will eating <laughs> make you feel less lonely? That's the next question. Well, it's pretty obvious. The answer is no, food is not actually going to keep me company. So the next question is, well, what will actually solve the problem of feeling lonely? Think about it, maybe call a friend, hang out with someone. If, if you have roommates or family around, like go watch TV with them. Doing something with another person, in essence, would be the answer to that. So then, now I've walked myself through it using reason, so then I realized, okay, well, if eating is not gonna solve my loneliness, and loneliness is what I'm feeling right now, but these other activities will, then I should take, <laughs> I should do those activities instead. Now, I realize some of these things are obviously easier said than done. When you're in those moments, it's very hard to kind of take that moment to stop and think. But the way that the workbook walks you through it is you start by having a printed out worksheet. So you literally sit down and you fill out that worksheet every time. As time goes on, you start training your brain. So then you start, instead of actually filling out the worksheet, you just read the worksheet and you answer the questions in your mind. Then over time, as that becomes very natural, then you should just start thinking and answering for yourself in your mind. And then when that becomes very second nature to you, you find that your brain, you've retrained your brain to go from the first feeling to the final question, the solution, without needing the in-between steps. So instead of needing to go through, okay, what am I feeling right now? What do I want to do? Will that help the feeling? No, it won't, what will? Instead of going through the whole process, your brain has shortened the length from step A to kind of step D. So it's, what am I feeling right now? I'm feeling lonely, I should call a friend. And it was a huge game changer for me in my recovery. That little exercise really did kind of save my life, so to speak. So the second one I wanna talk about is Finding a creative activity or a creative outlet. I talk about this a lot um, on Libro. We talk about this a lot. We have a lot of, we have a creativity column. Finding a way that you can immerse yourself in creativity, immerse yourself in something that's gonna make you feel good about yourself because of what you've accomplished, what you've been able to create. This is huge. So for me, there are two kind of primary things that I do in this category. 
The first one is makeup. So makeup artistry for me has always been a creative outlet. It's always been something I can immerse myself in, I can create something, and then I can feel proud about what I've created and feel that sense of self-accomplishment. The second thing that I do is I really like to build Lego. I'm a bit of a Lego nerd. Um, with Lego specifically, I find that although I really love building sets, following the directions, that's helpful in a different way. It's more of a immersing like your mind into like a more rhythmic um, kind of pattern, like completing a puzzle. The creativity side is when I create Lego that I don't have instructions for. So I have a safari scene that I've made and I'm constantly adding to it. And believe it or not, that's, that's been a huge help for me. Some other ideas are painting nail polish art, drawing, poetry, doing things with wood, like if you like to work with your hands, building models, painting models, um, building things with wood, doing wood chipping, there's a lot of different options. The number one um, kind of tip that I would give or advice that I would give is to have at least a couple that are literally at hand. So in the moment, you can dive into those projects without requiring a bunch of setup, with, without requiring even needing to leave your house, without requiring needing to go buy things. It's okay to have more complex creative outlets as well, but it's really important to have a couple really simple ones. If I just want to dive into something creative, I can just pull out my Lego and start building, or I can sit down at my makeup desk and start doing a look. It's very, very easy to do. So I recommend you um, trying out some things and seeing what you really like. Third thing is what I call positive reading. I'm not really sure why I said positive. I think it's just, I wouldn't really recommend like diving into a really, really heart-wrenching, you know, maybe depressing um, story. <laughs> so by positive reading, for me, um, in the early stages of my recovery, I actually read a lot of books written by people in recovery. Again, I stuck to the very positive books, very pro-recovery and motivational books. So I have a couple of them next to me right here and I'll show you. So first of all, Jenny Schaefer, um, a lot of us know her. She wrote Life Without Ed first and then Goodbye Ed, Hello Me. Both of these books are excellent. Life Without Ed, technically I would recommend reading it first and then Goodbye Ed, Hello Me. I learned so much from these books. I'm just dropping things everywhere. I learned so much from these books and I can't stop recommending them. Another book that I really love is Women, Food, and God by Janine Roth. I love pretty much all of Janine Roth's books. I haven't read them all, but every one I've read I've loved. Um, this is really, really solid. It's about um, emotional eating, breaking out of emotional eating, learning to love yourself and your body. It's a really, really excellent read. Those of you who read um, my blog or any of my articles on Libro know I love Anne Lamott. And this one is Traveling Mercies. It's probably my favorite one. Anything by Anne Lamott, she's just, she's got such a comforting way of writing and just, it's very relaxing, but it's also very inspiring and it just always makes me feel good. So I, I read a lot of her books. I'm not a big fiction person, but I do have some fiction that I love. Um, for me, my favorite is the Poisonwood Bible. This is huge because I got the collector's edition years ago for Christmas. Um, but I love the Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsilver. It's about um, a Baptist missionary family in Congo like years and years ago. It's, it's a really great book, but there's lots of great fiction out there. Next is mindful exercise. And I call it mindful exercise because Exercising recovery is a little bit of a tricky topic and you have to be really careful. I struggled with exercise addiction and it got really unhealthy really quickly. So very often, especially in the early stages of recovery, um, you're not even exercising at all, which is totally, totally okay. Now, if you have been given the green light to start exercising, I like what I call mindful exercising. So these are activities where you are choosing them for a specific purpose because of the way that they benefit you and benefit your mental health. And you're staying mindful throughout the activity to ensure that you're not falling into old um, obsessive behaviors, unhealthy behaviors. So a couple things that were really helpful are really enjoyable for me. So number one is hula hooping. Um, yeah, you can buy adult athletic hula hoops and I have one. Um, the reason I love hula hooping and have loved it for many years is because it's a very short, quick activity. You can hula hoop for five minutes and, and that's fine. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. 
and you're using your body in a very positive way. It makes you feel like Shakira. It's awesome. Um, so the second thing that um, has really helped me in recovery um, was my punching bag. So that was really good for an emotional release when I was really angry, really frustrated. It was a really healthy release for that. And again, with a punching bag, it's really hard to overdo it anyways. Like you do it for a couple minutes, you let the feelings out and then you're done. So that was really good. I also really enjoy yoga. Um, and I really enjoy Pilates. So those are also activities where I'm using my body and becoming kind of one with my body in a really positive way. So I really recommend those activities. I'm a runner. I love to run. However, early on in recovery, I did not run because it was too easy to go overboard. It was too easy to become obsessed. It was too easy to run way too often for way too long. Now I really love to run and I can do it um, within a balanced kind of rounded exercise relationship and it's really good for me but back then I I didn't run and I wasn't it wasn't recommended to me that I that I run <clears throat> my fifth tip um, for positive coping skills is writing and journaling so writing is kind of writing journaling blogging um, it really depends on the kind of person you are let's first talk about journaling Journaling is so important, at least it was to me in recovery. Whether you feel like you're a writer or not, a lot of people still experience a very positive release when they're able to write. To me, the benefits of journalism are self-awareness and self-accountability. So what I mean by that is when you're reflecting, let's say every night, when you're reflecting on the day, reflecting on how you feel, where your head is at, maybe what you're struggling with, what you're happy about, you are staying aware of yourself and staying aware of where you're at and what your feelings are. And you're in essence kind of staying connected to yourself, which is really, really important in recovery. And through that, you're also having some self accountability because if you're writing down your goals and then checking in with yourself, you're holding yourself accountable to those goals and you're holding yourself accountable to staying aware of where you are at and not slipping into self denial, not slipping back into a life of secrecy or a life of being in denial of what you may or may, may not be struggling with. So I really recommend journaling. And then if it suits you, it really helped me. Um, blogging was really good for me. I am a writer just by nature and there was something about blogging. It, it made me feel heard. It made me feel like I was less alone. There's an amazing blogging community out there, recovery blogging community. So it made me feel like I was part of something. And it also gave me a sense that I was able to help people because I didn't want to be going through what I was going through and have other people going through the same thing and, and not reach out and try to, to help because we're all kind of in this together. So for me, blogging was really good for that. So now on to a couple activities that really help me now but didn't necessarily help me in the early stages of my recovery. So the first one might seem strange, but the first one was taking baths. And the reason I say this is because I dealt with a lot of depression. I still deal with depression, but I dealt with a lot of depression when I was going through my eating disorder. And when I was depressed, I often would just want to go sit in the tub by myself, but I never felt better afterwards. And that's always a good indicator that a coping um, mechanism is not really working for you. I didn't feel better. I actually felt more alone. I'd feel more sad. I'd sit in the tub and just cry and cry and I'd become more and more depressed. So that's one of the reasons baths didn't work for me back then. Another reason was because it was just me and my body <laughs> in the tub <laughs> and that could turn into negative body thoughts very, very quickly. So I probably should have avoided bathing more than I did, but looking like looking back on it, it's not really something that I would recommend based on my own personal experience um, for the early stages in recovery. However, now um, I love to bath as a stress relief. I love to bath just for relaxation, for self-care. Now bathing um, makes me feel like I'm taking care of my body and I'm pampering my body and it, my relationship with, with taking baths has changed significantly. So now it's a really positive thing for me. And the second thing is baking and cooking. So I've always loved cooking. I've always loved baking. When I was in, again, the early stages of recovery, 
it wasn't exactly the healthiest thing because there was so much guilt around food, there was so much stress and anxiety around food, and there was a lot of obsession. So very often when I was baking or when I was cooking, it was all about making sure that I was making things as healthy as possible or as low in calories as possible, and it became this very obsessive thing. And then if I went overboard and maybe like gasp, had some of the cookie dough or whatever it was that I was making, then the guilt would start to set in and it just could spiral out of control. So it wasn't exactly the healthiest activity. Now, I love to cook and bake. Baking especially, I find it's a huge stress relief. It's very relaxing. It's fun. I have fun doing it. It's kind of helped rebuild my relationship with food. So as you can see later down the road in recovery, it's become a very positive thing for me. Well, that concludes my list. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful. If you have any coping skills for eating disorder recovery, please comment below. Um, we'd love to hear them. The whole Libro community, you know, we can all chip in and share our information, share, share what has worked for us, what maybe hasn't worked for us. And I hope you guys are having a wonderful week and I will talk to you guys really soon. Bye. But Zoe, Filming is over. You already missed it. You were in time out for being a brat.